welcome to my new calculus site. My name is John Gabriel, and today I'm going to be uh, discussing the fourth part in the series called What Your Ignorant Teachers Could Not Tell You. Uh, this series is focused on deriving everything in mathematics from nothing. And as we've seen in the previous two uh, videos, in the previous three videos, we've seen the derivation of point and location upon which everything in mathematics is based. So let's begin. Now, uh, there have been numerous fools in the course of the history of mathematics and its development in the mainstream. Some of the most influential are listed here. George Cantor, David Hilbert, Bertrand Russell, Wittgenstein, and Frege. And of course, the list goes on and on. And I want to tell you that uh, a lot of these so-called academics <clears throat> uh, took the ill-formed ideas of those who came before them. And instead of uh, showing them and exposing them for being what they are, they develop more theory on those ill-formed ideas, uh, leading to the absolute mess that we have today in mainstream academia, okay? Um, so the one I'm going to focus on most today is Wittgenstein, but I'd like to just quickly discuss Frege. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on Frege, but he was, a uh, a German philosopher, if you could call him that. He was really an idiot, and I wouldn't even call him a mathematician. But at any rate, he is believed to be the father of analytic philosophy. Uh, that's, even, that's not even a good expression. It's totally redundant, in my opinion, because philosophy is analytic. And this, uh, this statement here, <laughs> whoever wrote it, is quite uh, revealing. It's almost like a red flag. It says, though largely ignored during his lifetime, Giuseppe Piano and Bertrand Russell introduced his work to later generations of logicians and philosophers. Now, you know, whenever somebody is ignored, that should make any student or research uh, academic think twice. Uh, Giuseppe Piano was really the joke of Italians. Italian mathematicians. Uh, he was such a fool. He, uh, he came up with that unbelievable rock called piano axioms. And of course, Russell uh, was a big friend of pianos and they often uh, exchanged ideas and information. And both of them patted each other on the back several times. Uh, Russell, of course, was a big fan of Wittgenstein's. But let's continue just to read a few of the things here that sort of come to mind as I look at um, Frege. Um, it, it's, you know, reading what's written here kind of gives you some uh, depth of insight into why academics today are such assholes, or the majority of them are such assholes. Uh, but if you look at um, what the article has to say and what people thought of Freck, um, it's quite revealing that, you know, modern academics, here, this, this is kind of striking. It says, Freck was described by his students as a highly introverted person. There's nothing wrong with that, but seldom entering into dialogue, mostly facing the blackboard while lecturing, Guess what? Any educator facing the blackboard while lecturing shouldn't be in a classroom, uh, though being witty and sometimes bitterly sarcastic. Uh, being witty and sometimes bitterly sarcastic <laughs> is kind of what every mainstream academic allures to, okay, or uh, would love to be like. So, uh, they're not really witty, but they imagine that they're witty. And of course, sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. So um, uh, academics are highly stupid creatures uh, suffering immensely from the Dunning-Kruger effect. And, uh, you know, 
you have to be very, very careful when you read anything <clears throat> that is written by a PhD, okay? Um, PhDs have a special place in my book of infamy. And at any rate, uh, Fred was an idiot. Um, he didn't produce anything. And I'm not just saying that, it's a fact. You can go back and look at any of the works that he's written um, and see that nothing has actually come of it. Uh, there is nothing that one can say about Freg that stands out except a lot of uh, verbal diarrhea, which was uh, produced by his acolytes and those who loved him. Okay, so not to spend too much time on Freg because he really wasn't anyone important. Um, let's just get move this bar along so I can, yeah. So uh, the one I'd like to spend time on a little bit longer is Wittgenstein. Now, let me go back to my PowerPoint so I can collect my thoughts. Um, chapter four of my free ebook is the one in which I prove that there are no axioms or postulates in sound mathematics. Okay, so I've already shown you very clearly how to derive the concept, concepts of point and location, which weren't very clearly defined in Euclid's elements. And of course, Euclid didn't quite even state properly what is a, a straight line. He said, it's a line on which the points lie evenly. Well, that's true of every line, whether it's straight or not. Okay, and he, he actually tried in two or three definitions to well-define the line, but he failed. Uh, now, if you look at the previous parts in this uh, series, you will see that I have defined it from nothing without any contradictions, without any circularity in the way that Euclid should have written it down. At any rate, um, Euclid did succeed in his uh, ultimate quest, which was to write down <clears throat> these uh, foundational concepts of mathematics and develop everything from them. For example, uh, geometry, numbers, algebra, calculus, all of mathematics. And the most important concept that uh, without, without which mathematics would, would crumble, the ratio is what Euclid well defined. Okay. So now Euclid, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> does have some vague definitions and some which are circular, but I have fixed those. And I would encourage you to read my free ebook and study it to see where Euclid uh, could have done with some improvement. All right. So now let's look very quickly at Wittgenstein and uh, I've already uh, discussed a little bit of this in previous videos, but I want to show you how to think, okay? Now, uh, just before Wittgenstein starts his uh, preface here, there's a little introduction by Bertrand Russell in which Bertrand Russell, you know, with his two cents, pats Wittgenstein on the back. And, and this is how Wittgenstein begins. He says, this book will perhaps only be understood by those who have themselves already thought the thoughts which are expressed in it or similar thoughts. Hmm. Now, the very first sentence is a red flag. What this tells me is that Wittgenstein didn't have much confidence in his ability to convey his ideas and thoughts. In which case, why did he even bother? Um, if if uh, one has to already have thought these thoughts or, th or similar, hey, they could have arrived at the same conclusions as he did. In other words, the same bullshit as he did, right? Well, um, this statement fails the fourth property of, of what it means to be well formed. Now, I was the first human in history who gave uh, a method in which to dismiss bullshit and to determine which is a well formed concept. And here it is. I've stated these four points, but uh, where Wittgenstein immediately fails in that first sentence is property number four. These, anything that is logical and well-formed must exist 
ideally as a platonic, a perfect platonic form. What this means is that it exists independently of the human mind or any other mind as a noumenon. So I'd say one of the greatest German philosophers was Immanuel Kant for coining the term noumenon. Okay. So at any rate, um, it is like saying, this first statement here is like saying, if you don't think the way I do, then anything that you think can't be worth much because only I think logically and critically to which if he were in front of me right now, I tell the sexual deviant to go and fuck himself. Okay. Because I'm not intellectually inferior to anyone on the planet. And if I do not understand what the moron is trying to say and cannot determine whether or not it is well formed, then nobody else can. Okay. So, uh, the problem is that mainstream academics suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect. They imagine that they know better. They love to think of themselves as being somewhat bitterly sarcastic, turning their backs towards those whom they disdain, and uh, simply imagining that they are witty, when in fact they're a bunch of fools. So, um, what really stuns one as one reads through his preface is the utter disregard, the utter disregard uh, this character Wittgenstein had for everybody else. And of course, uh, he didn't really care if uh, there were those who could have some uh, different thoughts, not only similar thoughts, but different thoughts. So Wittgenstein didn't consider uh, ideas or thoughts which differed from his. His were the only thoughts that mattered, and this is how he was going to prove it. Of course, if you study the Tractatus, you'll see that he doesn't prove anything in particular, and that his ideas are actually complete rot, because there is no such thing as a perfect language, okay? And um, he says here, I will mention that to the great works of Freg, well, Freg had no works, never mind great works. And the writings of my friend, Bertrand Russell, well, <laughs> if you read the introduction Russell wrote, he says, I owe in large measure the stimulation of my thoughts. Wow. I guess he doesn't realize that he's paid himself a discompliment there because in that case, Russell and others had already thought of the rot he is about to write in the Tractatus. So he says, if this work has a value, it consists in two things. First, that in its thoughts are expressed. Hmm, wow, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that just a total redundancy? I mean, isn't that obvious? Uh, I wouldn't call that bitter sarcasm. I would call that bitter stupidity. And this value will be the greater the better the thoughts are expressed. Now, people might call me arrogant, by the way, because I am smarter than anybody I know, but that's not the point of this discussion. It's a fact that I'm smarter than anybody I know. Unlike Wittgenstein, my new calculus is irrefutable, okay? The, the facts that I have exposed in the moronic theories of mainstream are irrefutable and they have been proved. But in his case, he's making a complete fool of himself and he's showing it in the way he writes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> he says, uh, the more the nail has been hit on the head. Here I am conscious that I have fallen far short of the possible. Oh boy. Suddenly we have a little dip towards the other direction from arrogance to uh, a little bit of humility, simply because my powers are insufficient to cope with the task. May others come and do it better. Oh dear, poor Wittgenstein. So uh, out of the same mouth comes the first statement here, which says that if you haven't thought what I've thought, <laughs> well, then you're not going to understand what I'm saying. Well, sorry, Wittgenstein, but I'm not an idiot like you. So I haven't thought what you have thought. And so at any rate, uh, Wittgenstein continues to discuss these things. And he comes up with uh, some really strange ideas. And, and, and you'll start seeing it 
right here, he says, uh, let's look at these. He says, the world is everything that is the case. Wow, that is profoundly deep bullshit. <laughs> okay, the world is the totality of facts, not of things. Hmm. The world is determined by the facts and by these being all the facts. For the totality of facts determines both what is the case and also all that is not the case. Well, in other words, he, he says a lot of things here, okay? A lot of things here which actually don't say anything. They're not clear. They're ethereal. They're vague. Okay, ethereal and vague, the same thing. Um, I don't want to go on a rant here or just mutter on things, but from these things, from these uh, initial uh, rantings and stutterings of Wittgenstein comes his theory of logic, okay? And of course, the basic premise <clears throat> is one in which uh, Wittgenstein relates one thing or one object to another. Of course, uh, th there's nothing new to that. It's been around for a long time. It was even around before Wittgenstein, but he decides that that is the best way to form a theory of logic. Okay. So, um, you have, to, <clears throat> you have to read through this here to see that this poor, this poor individual was not only clear in his uh, tract of thinking, he was horribly confused, okay? And I don't want to spend too much time on Wittgenstein. I'd like you to read this. Uh, he says in this particular two point when he says, we make to ourselves pictures of facts. Uh, the picture presents the facts in logical space, the existence and non-existence of atomic facts. Well, an atomic fact is something that is the most simple fact. But at any rate, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff here which will give you a headache because it's not only incoherent, it doesn't say anything in particular. And even before, uh, he starts getting down to what he's going to talk about, which is the basic of his logic of uh, basic of his theory of logic. <laughs> it leaves you wondering what on earth he can possibly come up with, which is related to all these points. Okay. So I have studied this, and the first time I read this was when I was about, I'd say about the age of 11 or 12, but I've read it many times since then. Uh, it's total nonsense. It has no place in logical thinking, and it has affected uh, uh, the development of mainstream mathematics. So getting back to my... Uh, PowerPoint here. In chapter four of my free ebook, and it's this chapter here. Let's just go to it. Okay, it's a little bit slow. I don't know why. Okay, so this this chapter here will show you in a step-by-step -step fashion, okay, how to derive all the five requirements. They are not actions or postulates, please. That is a total deception or a misconception on the part of mainstream academics. It is a failure on their part to understand what Euclid was trying to do. And I'll show you here in this chapter, there is knowledge you have never seen before, everything from scratch okay, from nothing, from a void universe, how you can derive the five requirements systematically and logically. And I would strongly advise you to study this chapter because without it, you cannot understand mathematics. 
and you will not understand the next in the series that I'm going to be discussing. So I think I've talked <clears throat> quite a bit about these things and perhaps not in a good way because all my videos are impromptu and I don't record them more than once. So some of you might find them a little tedious, but if you just bear with me, you will learn more than you've learned in all your school career and in all your life, in all your journey so far. Um, well, <clears throat> I'm a little bit tired now, so I'm going to stop and I hope that you will join me again in the fifth part or the fifth series where I will continue to discuss more on how we got to the mathematics that we have today, how we got everything else, calculus and the well-formed concepts, not the nonsense that you will encounter in mainstream mathematics. Thanks for joining me. Till next time, this is a new calculus channel and I'm John Gabriel. Goodbye.